Okay, so now we're beginning the um, final set of readings for the unit on conflict theory. And um, I've asked you to read Anion's piece and you'll notice that it was published in 1979, which is pretty dated, but it's still quite relevant. I'm actually going to show you expert excerpts um, from a regular US history book for juniors that was used in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and you'll see that not much has changed. So let's begin with uh, revisiting some ideas from conflict theory. Conflict theorists point out that the relationships among the parts of society are rooted in competition, conflict, domination, and subordination. But in order to maintain the stability of our society, the elite actually wield their social, political, and economic power to promote and or to center the ideas that reinforce and support the status quo. Thus, the ruling ideas of the time are the ideas of the ruling class. And the elite can shape laws, values, arts, art, beliefs, and institutions, and the institutions of our society. And because they can do that, the integration that does happen the shared values and shared understanding of our history is achieved not through consensus, the way functionalists argue, but through, <laughs> excuse me, through um, co-optation, coercion, fraud, and manipulation. And one way that that happens is through education. Conflict theorists have shown how our education curriculum actually reinforces existing inequalities in society through the way our history is taught. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our textbooks aren't just a collection of social facts the way that the textbook committee members um, thought about them in the Wong piece. Textbooks are actually social products that have been created by big business and the need for big business to create profits, um, which shapes right, the books and the curriculum um, if you recall from Wong's work, the curriculum process is also influenced by educational expectations of parents, school personnel, school boards, and state selection committees. And while they're written by historians, curriculum experts, and publishing company publishing company personnel, they are written to prepare students for participation in political and economic and other social institutions as they are. So. When the intention is to in integrate students into adult roles and prepare them for our social institutions as they currently exist, that means we have to teach students ideas and understandings that support rather than challenge the status quo. So what counts as knowledge typically enhances dominant social groups. They legitimize certain social categories which also ultimately leads to marginalizing, erasing, and or minimizing other groups. That knowledge shapes our ideology, our belief systems that orient us towards interpreting the world, interpreting events, social phenomena in a particular way that privileges those who are already in power and that privileges those who already have privilege. Anion's study examined 17 well-known secondary school U.S. history books that were on a list of, a, of books approved for use by the school boards of two large urban school systems in the Northeast. The author analyzed content areas focusing on economic and labor union developments during the period of rapid industrialization and social change from the Civil War to World War I. The chapters related to the period of 1865 to 1917. All the books discuss the expansion of the railroads, communications, industry, new inventions, and the contributions of industrialists. All the books saw monopolies and trusts as a problem, but Anion says that the way that they talked about the responses to the problem actually disguises and even rationalizes economic concentration. Most of the books painted Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson's trust-busting efforts favorably, and praised the progressive era as a period of social reform and progress. The laws, though, were only partially successful at best. 
The authors didn't discuss the actual results of the legislation. The tone of the analysis showed that the corporations continue to concentrate their economic power. In essence, Anion argues that the textbooks sent the message that economic concentration was going to happen anyway. Anion says that the political institutions had good intentions and tried to um, curtail the economic concentration, but industry was able to find workarounds of the legislation, which ultimately teaches the students that you can't really regulate industry. In this way, the texts also teach that government isn't effective. Now that was 1979, right, that publication. Now what I'm showing you here is an excerpt in a that contemporary history book. Um, and you really, you see the same thing here. Look at the third paragraph of the text. It reads, Prosecuting companies under the Sherman Act was not easy, however, because the act didn't clearly define terms such as trust. In addition, if firms such as Standard Oil felt pressure from the government, they simply reorganized into single corporations. The Supreme Court threw out seven of the eight cases the federal government brought against trusts. Eventually, the government stopped trying to enforce the Sherman Act, and the consolidation of business continued. C. Even here, you see how the government couldn't draft legislation to make effective laws, and most of the cases that they tried to bring to the courts actually got thrown out, another in indicator of the ineptness of government. And the paragraph shows that businesses find ways to outsmart government. Finally, the paragraph ends with a sense of inevitability. The government gives up and business as usual continues. Textbooks presented governmental reforms as a legitimate way to address economic problems. They also dismissed, undermined, or ignored more radical approaches to address economic problems. The irony of this is that the texts both show that government is ineffective, but also centered the actions of government, crediting them with addressing the economic problems. Annual reports that industrialists, managers, workers, and inventors get unequal coverage in the textbooks. Industrialists and inventors get are given more attention than other groups, and they are also presented as being responsible for the industrial progress. He notes that none of the books described industrial workers in detail. Moreover, the texts also did, do not discuss um, how the concentration of power impacts workers, only focusing on the fact, on the impact of monopolies or on small businesses and consumers. Um, actual historians point out that industrialists often worked to prevent the formation of labor unions and often resor resorted to using violence against workers, yet only eight of the books provided examples of such activities. He said the rest of the books either omitted or rationalized the violence industrialists used against workers. And when conflict between industrialists and labor are presented, he says the representation of labor is often really narrowly discussed and they present, they, the textbooks, present the more radical segments of unions in a very unfavorable light. The text also frames strikes as successful only when the government intervened. Moreover, they tended to focus on the American Federation of Labor, talking about them as much as they discussed all other labor unions combined. Um, I would really like you to pay attention to Anion's analysis of the way labor is presented and how it relates to our understanding of workers and their experiences. Um, you'll notice that I have some arrows on um, this uh, picture of the contemporary book. I just wanted you to, to notice that one, they're referring to Andrew Carnegie here, but they've also got this section on social Darwinism and you'll see the frame, it says popular literature promoted the possibility of rags to riches um, success for anyone who is virtuous and hardworking. And again, this kind of is an implicit way of um, ignoring the way that social structures shape people's life chances um, and focuses on this kind of exceptional mobility that happens um, for a few people. Um, and, and again, like Andrew Carnegie is throughout the contemporary um, textbook. And again, he's, a, he's an industrialist. Okay. Andrew Carnegie was one of the industrialists as, that was discussed in the textbook that Anion reviewed. Carnegie was um, one that received a lot of attention, again, um, by the contemporary textbooks. 
Um, the textbooks didn't acknowledge his uh, strong opposition to labor unions. The textbooks paint um, are painted, or the industrialists paint the um, the textbooks paint the industrialists in a really positive light. Um, even misrepresenting facts related to industrialists. Enyan says that the way people um, that way that the way people like Carnegie are presented promotes a myth that legitimizes hard work and thrift and tends to emphasize talk about their humble beginnings. The text presented the industrialist as as examples of people experiencing exceptional social mobility and giving back to the community. We see the same thing in today's textbooks. This text text says that Andrew Carnegie came from a penniless family and that he worked his way up in the Pennsylvania rail yard to become the local superintendent. The write-up actually uses the line, his rise from rags to riches, along with his passion for supporting charities, made him a model of the American success story. Anion's findings from 1979 ring true with this contemporary textbook. This textbook also painted Carnegie in a um, positive light notice that um, this excerpt uh, they highlight that he donated about 90% of, of the wealth he accumulated during his lifetime. Like the textbooks of the past, Carnegie's wealth accumulation is framed positively as though such wealth accumulation is what leads to improvements in um, our communities. Anden writes that the ways the various groups are presented and the historical accounts of the period after, after the Civil War and up to World War I favors the wealthy and powerful. He notes that the way businessmen of the late 19th century were discussed presents them as heroes. Anden calls the high school social studies courses a service to corporate interests, providing ideological support for industrial hierarchy that fostered conformity to corporate values. And the way that textbooks are presented or didn't represent Sorry, and the way that the textbooks represented or didn't represent the working class or labor contributes to the failure of workers developing a working class identity, which is actually advantageous for the owning class, for powerful business groups. Our contemporary textbooks paint a very similar picture. And as was the case more than 30 years ago, our textbooks per perpetuate this same mythology. So please, please, please. Um, you know, pay attention to the way that um, Anion, um presents the analysis of um, that period between the Civil War and World War One. You know, it a, a lot of what he says in that in that piece is actually very consistent with what we see in our textbooks today. So, the ruling of ideas of the the right, the ruling ideas of the time are still the ideas of the ruling class. <laughs>